You may be seated, friends. I want to welcome you to Stillwater Church today. My name is John. I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm just so thankful that you joined us to worship Jesus. Uh, we are talking in this new message series uh, about, uh, about honor. In the past couple of weeks, we've been, let's see, two weeks ago, we honored moms. Uh, that was awesome. Last week, we got to honor our graduates. Uh, also, another very fun week. Uh, this week, uh, we're, ta- we're not honoring anyone in specific this week, or in particular. Uh, instead, what we're doing is we're, we're talking about honor at Itself. And we're talking about times, uh, perhaps, you know, how do we operate when we're not shown honor by others? That happens sometimes. Sometimes uh, others don't show us the honor that perhaps we wish they would. Uh, you know, we live in a, in a society where honor is often forgotten or at least reduced uh, in terms of how it's shown. I'm, I'm wondering, if we did a straw poll here, think back throughout your life. Think about just the overall value of of honor in our society. Would you say in your lifetime that honor has increased or decreased in in what you've seen? Does anybody say that our society honor has increased during your lifetime? Anybody? About nobody? (laughs) Maybe a couple. Anybody say that it's decreased during my lifetime? Yeah, look around. And... And for those, and there's hands around who've been on this earth who longer than me, right? And say, yeah, I've seen a lot of honor decreasing in my lifetime. We, we've kind of lost some of these values, or we struggle to show some of these values. We used to measure a person's worth by how they treated others around them. Whereas today, we oftentimes celebrate those who belittle and insult those around them. We, we, we celebrate the wrong things as a, as a society sometimes. We've got a picture here of a guy named, on the left, named Andrew. Uh, He made national news not too long ago because he had the unfortunate encounter with a guy on the other side, which is 50 Cent. You might recognize him, although he's bankrupt now, right? So does that reduce him to nickel or dime? I don't know how that works uh, branding-wise, but regardless. So these guys met up in the airport. Andrew is uh, from Cincinnati. Um, he's a, a great guy who struggles uh, with, with autism and with a social anxiety disorder. Uh, but Andrew has a job, I believe his first job, at the airport there uh, where he works as a janitor. Well, anyway, 50 Cent got off the airplane one day and he encountered uh, Andrew working. And because of Andrew's disability, uh, 50 Cent made a mistake. He thought that Andrew was high, but he's not high. Uh, he, this is just kind of how he is. It's, it's because of the disability, how he operates. And so, so unfortunately, uh, 50 Cent decided to make a video of, of Andrew and mock him. Now, I would have shown you the video, but it's not exactly safe for church in terms of its... We would have had to beep out the whole video, basically. So... And it's almost kind of ironic, don't you think? A rapper making fun of somebody else who's working and, and, and who's allegedly using drugs, right? I mean, that's like what they sing about 95% of the time, right? So, so of all people who would have no moral authority to call them out, that would be the one. But, but here's this guy, this, this, this rich and powerful guy who, who decides to, to uh, show not only to, to dishonor, but to insult, to, to hurt somebody else who's, who's powerless, who's just a, a normal average guy trying to do his job. We, that's where we've come to as a society, where the powerful mock the normal and the powerless, and on top of that, we pay them to do so, right? We, we show these people honor who, who do this. I think that C.S. Lewis said it best when he said, we laugh at honor and are shocked to find traitors in our midst. Think about that. We we laugh at honor. We don't value it anymore. And we're shocked when we find in our midst people who are mocking others, people who are traitors to that which we believe to be most important as a society. I'm betting that every person in this room can remember times where they were disrespected or not honored, uh, not, not shown the, the care that they should have been, been shown. If you haven't encountered that yet in life, just wait. I promise you will. It's part of the human experience because we live around sinful people, right? We, we all interact with sinful people, and this value of honor has, has decreased. And today we're going to look at the story of a woman in the Bible 
who was faced with this same reality, uh, with folks who were not showing her the honor, the respect that she should be shown. Uh, but we're going to look at how she rose above it and how God used her in spite of that. So we're today we're in 1 Samuel chapter 1, uh, and the story goes like this. There was, there was this guy... Um, an Israelite man. His name was Elkanah. And Elkanah had two wives, Hannah and Penina. Okay, so Elkanah is, is the guy. Hannah and Penina are his wives. Now remember, the Bible does not support everything that it reports, right? And, and most of the characters we believe at that time uh, did have one wife, but there were some who had multiple wives for whatever reason. And, and so this guy uh, has a challenge because this kind of reflects a story we told a few weeks ago about Jacob. You remember Jacob uh, had two wives as well. One could have children, one could not. Well, well Pani- uh, excuse me, Elkanah had this exact same reality, uh, that one of his wives, Hannah, was barren. She couldn't have any children. And, and remember that that was, that was a big, big deal, okay? I mean, it's still a big deal. It's painful to not be able to have kids. It's, it's challenging. It's, it's disappointing. It's, it's uh, depressing for some. It's, but in those days, it was all those things, plus it was an economic problem. Because remember, your kids in those days were like your 401k, right? This is how you're going to retire someday. You have plenty of kids. In fact, it was a farming society, so you wanted to have lots of kids, particularly male children, because they would be able to help out around the house and someday take over the farm or the business that you did, and they would be the ones who would help you as you aged, okay? doesn't mean it's the right way to live. It's the way that they lived in their society. So, so you have Hannah who can't have any, any children, and, and we don't know, but that could even be the reason why he had a second wife. That was a very common reason for taking a second wife, because you needed to have children. So if one couldn't have kids, oftentimes you'd marry somebody else. Well, anyways, uh, like they had a, a tradition where they would uh, make it, make a pilgrimage to Shiloh, which at the time was the place where the tabernacle was, the place where they would worship God. And so Elkanah would take his wives and Penina's children, and they would go and to, to worship God once a year. And this was a big deal. It was like a religious festival kind of thing. We're not sure exactly what it was that he was attending, but think of it in our terms like Christmas Eve, right? Uh, like you get together with your family and your friends and you come to church. If you're out of town, you probably go to another church somewhere and, and you go and it's a big deal because we're celebrating uh, Jesus coming down to earth and we're also celebrating our love for each other and are just enjoying being together as a family. So it's a big, big deal. So that's probably kind of like what this trip was. Well, the challenge was that, that Hannah would be treated kind of as a second-class citizen. Here we have 1 Samuel uh, chapter 1, verse 4. On the days where Elkanah presented the sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to Penina and each of her children. And though he loved Hannah, he would only give her one choice portion because the Lord had given her no children. That's how she was treated. Second class. Think about it. So it's kind of like for you, Christmas Eve this year, your family's getting ready to go, and everybody's getting dressed up, and you're going to go to church, and you're going to come back home and have dinner and do whatever your traditions are. And let's say that you're getting ready to go, and a member of your family kind of pulls you aside and says, hey, uh, one thing, you know, this year uh, you haven't really been pulling your weight around the household. Maybe you, you lost a job, or maybe you just haven't been doing as well, whatever it's been. So I'm going to need you to stay home from Christmas Eve, and how about if you make dinner for everybody, and then when we come home, we'll eat the dinner that you prepared? Because that's probably about right, because you just, you haven't been contributing to the family like you should be. That would hurt, wouldn't it? Nobody would want to be, you know, not that there's anything with making dinner, but, but the feeling of being left out, specifically because you hadn't, like, met some expectation. And poor Hannah, it's not like she could do anything different. It's not like she didn't want to have kids. This was just a physical issue for her. She was unable to have kids. So she was treated as a second-class citizen. I'm betting that you know what this is like in some way or another. 
I'm betting that you know what it's like. You, maybe for you, you had that, that sibling that you could never keep up with. You would work so hard in school and you'd get the best grades you could, but, but they'd always get the straight A's and, and you wouldn't. And you always felt, felt like you just didn't measure up. Or maybe they were the great athlete or the great musician or whatever it was, and you just always felt like you were kind of lagging behind. Or maybe it's somebody at your job who you struggle to keep up with or you struggle to please. Maybe the expectations just feel so unreasonable. Or maybe it's some other relationship in your life where you just, you work and you work and you work, but you don't feel like you can meet their expectations. You don't feel like they honor you. You don't feel like, and, and maybe they make it very direct that they don't honor you. We know what that's like. Verse 6, it gets worse. So Penina, that's the, the wife who can have children, would taunt Hannah and would make fun of her because the Lord had kept her from having children. So it gives us kind of another twist. It's like, for some reason, God is not allowing her to have children yet. Verse 7, year after year, it was the same. Penina would taunt Hannah as they went to the tabernacle. Each time, Hannah would be reduced to tears and would not even eat. So think about that. Every stinking Christmas Eve, you're getting insulted. You're getting made fun of. For something that's not your fault, not what, something you can't control, this is like, it's like the family tradition now. Make fun of you day, right? You're not being honored. You're not being, being showed that care that you, you should be shown. Then verse 8, uh, her husband asked, Why are you crying? Why aren't you eating? Why be downhearted just because you have no children? You have me. Isn't that better than having 10 sons? <laughs> Spoken like a true male, right? <laughs> what more could you want? You know, I'm smart, I'm strong, I'm beautiful. Here I am, right? Well, how are you not happy? What's your problem, Hannah? Get over it. See, like, it's kind of like her pain keeps getting minimized and minimized, minimized by others. They don't care about her, and, and that that hurts. That hurts. It says that she was downhearted. A more literal translation would be that she was depressed. This was putting her in a really bad place. She had this antagonist, this Penina is her name. And you know, it's true that every person has a Penina, right? Every person has somebody, or maybe more than one somebody's, who, who doesn't treat us right. I'm betting that you can picture yours right now. Picture one, maybe it was in your past, maybe it's in your present. Like I say, if you don't have one, just wait. You'll get one someday, I promise. Every person has this. It's, it's a challenging reality of life. Sometimes we have a lot of Peninas, people who don't believe in us, people who discourage us, uh, people who, who gossip about us, maybe people who intimidate us or make life so much harder to bear. And so, so Hannah suffers under this year after year after year. Verse 9, once after the sacrificial meal at Shiloh, Hannah got up and went to pray. Eli, the priest, was sitting at his customary place beside the entrance of the tabernacle. Hannah was in a deep anguish, crying bitterly as she prayed to the Lord. And she made this vow. O Lord of heaven's armies, if you would look upon my sorrow and answer my prayer and give me a son, then I will give him back to you. He will be yours for his entire lifetime as a sign that he has been dedicated to the Lord. His hair will never be cut. Okay, so that's talking about, uh, the Bible talks about a Nazarite vow, where uh, they don't cut the person's hair, uh, they stay away from, from alcohol, uh, there's, uh, don't touch, touch dead bodies. There's other certain specifications there. It sounds like something like that. She's basically saying, God, I want a, I want a baby so much that if you would give me a baby, I'll dedicate that baby to you. I'll, y y he's yours, right? Like, like, I'll take care of him when he's little, right? Get him old enough, and then he's all yours. And notice that she's not even really, it's a type of bargaining, but it's still kind of a selfless bargaining. It's, she doesn't say, hey, if you would give me three kids, right, then, then number three is yours, God, right? You know, after I've kind of got those two that I need to have just to show that stupid penina, you know, then you can have one of them, right? She doesn't even say that. She said, God, I'm so desperate for this. I want this so much. If you would make this happen, I would even give this child back to you. Verse 12, as she was praying to the Lord, Eli watched her. Eli is the priest, right? Kind of like the, the pastor, if you will. Seeing her lips move but hearing no sound, he thought she'd been drinking. Must you come here drunk, he demanded. Throw away your wine. 
poor Hannah, now even the clergy is mocking her, right? It doesn't get much lower than that when the clergy is mocking you. We're not even good at that stuff, right? And, and, and yet here, she's getting made fun of by, by the, the priest. It, poor Hannah. How's she going to go on? I mean, she's, she's hurting. She's, she's crying. She's depressed. She's dishonored for something that is not even her fault. And she doesn't know that necessarily that God's caused this to happen. She just knows that she can't have children. And there doesn't seem to be any hope. There doesn't seem to be any future. Because there wasn't many other options for her. They didn't have colleges back then. So she can't be like, well, I'm going to just be a career person, you know, and that's cool. It wasn't an option then, right? Like this was, unfortunately, kind of her lot in life. And it didn't seem like there was any hope of it getting any better. But Hannah was somehow able to continue operating. And I want to pause the story for just a minute because we've got to be able to continue operating too when, when others don't show us honor. Because it's going to happen. And if, if when others don't show us honor, if we get totally sidetracked and we're unable to function, we're going to let others control our life always, because there'll always be somebody who doesn't show you the honor that they should show you. And, and so I've got a simple illustration this morning um, that, that kind of helps us. Well, Tyler talked earlier about knowing who he is, right, when he was in the band and he was trying to figure out, if I don't have all this stuff, who am I? And, and I think this kind of helps, because at our core is our character, right? Okay, that's, that's like the most central thing you have, that your relationship with God and your character. That is who you are. Nobody can change that. Nobody can touch that. And you see, your character, this all begins with the fact that when you ask Jesus into your life, you are a child of God. You are a daughter or a son of God. He loves you so much, he adopts you into his family. And that is an incredibly high status. That God wants you, God chooses you as his child, okay? So that's your character. Out of your character comes your values, okay? Your, your values also are very important. And you see both of these are in red, where the others are going to be in blue. And this is important because these are the things that are central about you. They are who you are, okay? Your character is who you are. Your values are what matters most to you. Nobody can change these. You get to set your values, okay? These are things that the only person who can change them is you. You own them, they're yours. Everything else is kind of outside of you. And, and see, if, we want, if we're going to deal with people who don't show us honor, we've got to have our character and our values be extremely strong. We've got to know who we are in Jesus Christ, and we've got to know what we believe in. Because when life gets tough, as it will, when problems come, as they will, we've got to know who we are and what we believe in. Nobody, nothing else can change that, okay? The third thing, this is where it starts to get outside of us, is our viewpoints, okay? Our viewpoints are how we see things. Your values, what matters to you, shape how you see things. They shape your, your impression of the world. We all know that in this world, two people can look at the same thing and have very different opinions on it, very different viewpoints. Now, folks will sometimes critique your viewpoints or they'll differ from your viewpoints. That is okay. See, one of our problems is we don't always know what it means to be dishonored. Sometimes we think that to be dishonored means somebody disagrees with us. That's not true. That's not true. Viewpoints are very debatable. Yours, mine, everybody else's, okay? You have yours, I have mine. People can debate these things all day. But that's outside of you. That's not your character, who you are, or, or that's not your values, what matters to you. A uh, fourth thing, strategies, how we approach things, okay? Especially if you work in a job or you're in a family, these next two are going to be central because strategies are also something that we can debate, we can discuss, we can disagree on. It's kind of how we go about things. And finally, the fifth is execution, how we do stuff. Now, where dishonor becomes a problem is when we, st we, we critique in, in the red zone there, right? It's okay to critique in the blue zone. If you've got a boss, they're going to critique in the blue zone. 
Sometimes they're going to disagree with what you're doing or how you're approaching it or maybe even how you're seeing the problem. If you've got relatives, they're going to critique in those areas. Like, let's just say at your house, uh, let's say that cleaning is an issue, right? Let's use a simple one. I'm sure it's not at your house, but let's say there's some disagreement around cleaning. And we may debate around our, our execution, right? Is the person really sweeping the floor effectively or are they just kind of phoning it in? You know, you were supposed to sweep the floor but never happens in our houses, I'm sure. But, you know, like somebody's supposed to sweep the floor and you're going like, I don't even think you swept this, right? It's a mess still. Uh, or, or then there may be strategies, okay? How were you going about this cleaning? You know, what, you know, what was your ideas behind this or your viewpoints? Does the house need to be cleaned more than, say, once a month, right? You know, we can debate these kinds of things, and that's fair game. Now, we've got to do it in love. We've got to do it respect, respectfully. It's always about how we say things, of course. But those are all debatable. What we don't debate is those values and character, right? If someone is struggling to, to clean the house well, right? We don't say, you know what? The reason why these floors is, are always dirty is because you don't care about this family. It's apparent. Look at that floor, right? If you cared about this family, you would do a better job time out. We've entered the red zone now, okay? Be and you can't do that. That's going to cause hurt. That's going to, that's going to cause pain. That's going to <laughs> cause for worse floors, probably, if anything, right? It's not going to be effective. And then even worse than that, we call into in, in uh, question the person's character. You're lazy. You, 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 don't, you don't do anything worthwhile. You just want to sit around here all the time and do nothing. You're, you're useless to this family. And you see, when we've gotten here, we've gone all the way from how to sweep a floor down to deeply personal insults that you don't get to take those back. And you know, there can be forgiveness, there can be all these kinds of things, but those words stick. You, you can't put that toothpaste back in the tube, right? It, it, those are things that cause so much damage. So we've got to make sure that in our critiques of others that we're loving. And also we have to make sure that as we re receive critique from others that we understand when they're critiquing something that's, that's fair to be critiqued. I think that Hannah was, was able to do this because if you see her response in verse 15 to Eli, uh, she debates with him. He's, he's, uh, he's brought about something that may be an execution, right? That she's been drinking too much that day, right? And she says, oh no, sir, I haven't been drinking wine or anything stronger, but I am very discouraged. I was pouring my heart out to the Lord. Don't think that I'm a wicked woman, for I have been praying out of great anguish and sorrow. Some of you have prayed like that before. You know what it's like to just lay it all on the line with God. Maybe you're, you're crying, you're, you're hurting, and God hears that. God hears Hannah's cry. God hears Hannah's prayers. God, the Bible says in 1 Peter that we can cast all of our cares on God because God cares for us. God cares for you, Hannah. God cares for you. No matter what, no matter what you've been through, no matter what others may think about you, no matter what others may say about you, God cares. And he responds. Verse 17, Eli says, in that case, go in peace. May the God of Israel grant the request you have asked him. Oh, thank you, sir, she exclaimed. Then she went back and began to eat again, and she was no longer sad. Now, isn't that interesting? Eli says, well, oh, hopefully God will grant this to you. And then she goes back. She doesn't have any answer yet. She doesn't have any promise or guarantee because sometimes when we pray, we get exactly what we ask for. It's a yes. Sometimes we get a, a wait, right? It's, it's not time yet. And sometimes we even get no. Those are answers that are all valid answers from God. We don't like them all equally, but they are all answers from God. But, but she goes on and she goes forward and Hannah lives an honorable life. Even when others didn't honor Hannah, Hannah lives an honorable life. She doesn't insult Penina back. She doesn't, she doesn't dip down into that level. Sometimes when others don't honor us, we go right to the same level that they're at. And folks, as followers of Jesus, we should be different. The culture 
culture, or excuse me, the cross calls, calls us to live differently than what the culture calls us to live, okay? Just because the culture values insulting, values harming, uh, values shaming, that doesn't mean that that's our way. That's not Jesus' way. He calls us to a higher standard, and we're to live in that. Hannah never gives up, and we shouldn't either. Never give up on living an honorable life, even when others mock or bully you, okay? Never give that up because your heavenly Father hasn't forgotten you. He hasn't given up. He's not going to give up. He's not going to quit on you. He's not going to forget about you. He's going to love you. He's going to support you. He's going to help you through this time. There's an urban legend that says that uh, Sir Winston Ch Churchill was once asked to speak at the very, towards the very end of his life, that he was asked to speak at, at the school that he once almost flunked out of. And, and he stood up and he gave a very short speech about, about never giving up. And it's a great story, but it's not actually how it happened. He did say those words, but it was in a very different context. It was long before he was Sir Winston Churchill. It was, it was way back when there was four years left in World War II. And, and Churchill had been, had been pushing the nation forward, and it wasn't always easy, and things didn't always go so well, and they were just starting to get traction and just starting to move forward. And, and, and he was making a speech, and, and, and people's uh, ability to keep on going was wearing thin because it was such a difficult time. And that's when he said these words. He said, never give in, never give in, never, 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 in nothing great or small, large or petty, never give in except to convictions of honor and good sense. Don't give up. Hannah. I don't care how loud the Peninas are. Don't give up. God hasn't given up on you. Don't give up. Don't give in except to convictions of honor and good sense. Of course, we make Jesus the Lord, so we, we center our lives around him and how he wants to us to live. It's not just stubbornness for the sake, sake of stubbornness. It's it's that we won't give up when others dishonor us because we know what God can do. And you know, God answers Hannah's prayer. She's blessed with a child. This child is born and she, she names him Samuel, which means God hears. God has heard her prayer. He has honored her. He has given her this child. And she fulfills her promise. She raises Samuel to where he's old enough, and then she takes him to Eli the priest, and she commits him to God's service. Samuel will, will serve there as, as a boy and, and eventually as a man, uh, and he will be called to be one of God's greatest prophets in the whole Bible. He will speak God's word to the people. He will, he will counsel kings. He will appoint King David to be the king someday. God will use Samuel. And you know, in the midst of our current situation, our current problems and our current challenges, it's hard to see the Samuels. It's hard to imagine what God can do. It's hard to realize that God could do something bigger than what we see today, but he can. He can. He's done it in the past, and he'll do it in the future. God has, God has not done with this kind of work. We're going to hop to verse number 8 of chapter 2. I'm skipping forward just a few. Um, and I want you to read this, these next couple of verses, verses 8 and 9. I want you to read them with me. Let's read them aloud and, and loudly, because these are God's promises us, to us. Read with me. He lifts the poor from the dust and the needy from the garbage dump. He sets them among the princes, placing them in seats of honor. For all the earth is the Lord's, and he has set the world in order. He will protect his faithful ones, but the wicked will disappear in darkness. No one will succeed by strength alone. These are Hannah's words. These are the words of somebody who knows what it's like to be dishonored and to go forward. Let them be your prayer too. God, thank you for the story of Hannah, for the encouragement that we can find from her, for the strength that she had to follow you. God, I pray that you would give us that same strength. For we ourselves, we deal with Peninnas. We deal with pain. We deal with suffering. We deal with hurt, God. And, and we need your help. We need your love. We need your support. We need your grace in our lives. God, would you meet us right where we're at today? 
whether we're in a place where we're looking back on the many great victories you've brought about and we're saying, God, thank you. Or whether we're in the place where we're just praying for those victories and we're hoping for them and we're trusting you for them. God, would you meet us in that place as well? Wherever it may be, God, would you meet us there and would you be bringing about Samuels in our lives? For God, we love you and pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.